the international community has also benefited from their outstanding experience. I would like to kind of ask each panelist, what do they think, like in a few words, what is the contribution of young professionals in different domains that they, they are in? What are the contributions that we can bring, either being in a technology, economy, policy? Each of them are going to give us their own expertise, what they're expecting from us, and then we're going to open up from the, uh, the question to everyone here. Thank you very much, and thank you for uh, inviting us in this um, conference of uh, Rwandan Young Professionals. So I think you are coming from uh, very far. You know, uh, before 94, uh, the diaspora or the Rwandan community abroad was a problem. Uh, there was limited contact with uh, the embassy. Uh, of course, there are refugees, but even those who are not refugees, the, the students and others, uh, were not organized in a, in a, uh, in a community. Uh, but now uh, there, there was a f fundamental shift. Uh, in the Rwandan uh, policy towards the, the, uh, the community abroad, which is a part of the society, which has to uh, contribute in various sectors uh, to the development of the country. It is even in our policy document, in our vision uh, uh, 2015, our NST1. Uh, it's really uh, important because uh, we as a community living in Rwanda, living abroad, we are all together to, to try to, to find uh, skills, the right skills for our uh, country, the right investment uh, from our citizen living abroad, but also uh, the collaboration with the citizens uh, and uh, other investors in, uh, in different countries uh, to invest in our country. So it's really important to have this kind of uh, uh, young uh, professional conference. Uh, and uh, I'm glad that uh, it was announced that we'll have an annual event of this kind. It will also be important uh, maybe to think uh, how to have I don't know if it's done here, uh, the clusters, professional clusters uh, of, uh, of uh, the community abroad, uh, having uh, physicians, uh, lawyers, uh, engineers, so that to th uh, think what they can do for, for their country from where they are, or how they can come back to Rwanda to, uh, to uh, work with us to further develop our country. So I think it's really an important uh, opportunity. I hope that we will, uh, we will go uh, uh, further in, uh, in, in this uh, uh, direction. Thank you. Thanks, moderator. I'm putting Dr. Kabiruka in the frame. Uh, he was very active in uh, driving forward as a member of the team uh, of HE uh, to put together the African free trade area and so he probably should be giving us uh, some kind of brief of uh, where we are and uh, the opportunities this opens up for for Rwanda and for you, all of you who are here. Because when you begin thinking about home, don't only think about Rwanda, think also of the possibilities that the African free trade area is going to open for all of you. The next thing I wanted to bring up is um, everybody talked actually about different things that I would have wanted to talk about, so that makes it easier for me. There is no part-time Rwandan being Rwandan is a full-time status. It doesn't matter where you are. Whether you are here, whether you are in any other country, or whether you are in Rwanda, you are Rwandan. I, I, I think somebody did talk earlier about the fact, wherever you are, you are Rwanda's ambassadors. Never forget that. I disagree with the Manuel earlier on who seemed to think you can only contribute when you are in Rwanda. As a Rwandan, a full-time Rwandan, you can contribute wherever you are. Always. If you want to come home, fine. But come home when you feel that 
it is actually what you want to do. Secondly, if you come to Rwanda, do not expect that you are going to be pampered. It's going to be a very hard slog. You will not be sent a ticket. Nobody will be at the airport waiting for you. You won't have a house ready, rented for you. You really have to think very hard about it. Is this what I want to do? And then go ahead and do it. But there will be rewards. If you do it and you are modest enough to understand that those who are there are not any less than you, that they are in fact the ones who have taken our country where it is now, and you are prepared to work as hard as everybody, if you can make it through one year, then you really are going to succeed. <laughs> But it is not going to be easy. The other thing I wanted to bring up is Brand Rwanda. Somebody talked about it. I, the other day I walked from Manhattan where we live to Harlem. I wanted, because you cannot get your hair cut. There are no African saloons in, 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 in um, uh, Manhattan. So I walked to Harlem. And I went into the first black saloon I, I found. I waited for the customer who was there to get his hair done, and then I sat, and the barber start, struck a conversation. He asked me where I come from. I said, Rwanda. And he said, what? Well, really, what President Kagame has done there? This is a barber in Harlem. I did the same thing about a month ago. I went to another barber in Geneva from Sierra Leone, and when I told him I nowadays live in Rwanda, he started telling me all about Rwanda, almost as if he has lived there. So what I'm trying to tell you is, brand is created by all of us. How we behave, what we do, what people know about us. The way you behave here adds or reduces, subtracts on brand Rwanda. So remember you've got quite a heavy burden making sure that you live up to the reputation that the rest of your compatriots have actually created about Rwanda. Remember that all the time and things will be fine. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Boy, it's going to be difficult to top that, but let me try. So, you know, the, the, the first email from a computer to another computer was between uh, Los Angeles and San Francisco in 1976. The first time ever an email crossed between two computers wirelessly. The first time I saw web, World Wide Web, I was here in Bloomington uh, in early 1983. It had been around for the military f since the 50s, but civilian use for the first time ever was in 1983. I was in Bloomington. The first cell phone that was ever commercialized, I saw it. It was in 1987. I was in Bloomington. Then you fast forward to today, and with the technology and globalization, I don't even know if you can claim I am from here or there your home actually exists in your heart more than any place else. So for me, being Rwandan is not because I'm sitting in Kigali. When I sit in Geneva on a plane over the Atlantic in Japan here, Rwanda is inside your heart. And you can get there immediately because all you need is to send a, an SMS or, a, or an, a WhatsApp and I'm talking to whoever is there. So what does that mean then for, for those of you who at least are interested in contributing back? It simply means that wherever you are, you are actually in Rwanda. Because you can access the country, you can interact with the country, you can physically go there if you want, but it's no different than sitting in Giseni and talking to someone in Kibungo. And if you want, you can go have a beer with that person in Kibungo, but you're in Rwanda. 
How is it any different than being in Boston and sending a note and talking to Dr. Kaberuka over something in a matter of seconds? So, so then that really shifts your theater of how you contribute to the country. In other words, everywhere you are is your theater. And everywhere you are, you can drive that, that contribution. And I think if you start thinking about it that way, and, 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 and then be conscious that then your actions through globalization and technology has an impact on those who are there, and probably those who are around you, it, it shifts the perspective. So I would simply say that keep in mind that being in Rwanda is not being in Kigali or in uh, Kivungo. It's actually being in Rwanda in your heart. The rest is globalization and communications takes care of it. Thank you. I think to respond to a question about the contribution of this young professionals I see, I see here to our development journey. Let me start by uh, telling you the way we see our youth as a government. First of all, we see our youth as the future of our nation. And uh, we can see that our youth is uh, at the forefront of change through research and innovation. Also, we see our youth, our Rwandan youth, as agent of uh, national building. And again, also we see uh, our youth, especially young professionals, as people who can now lead that innovation process. So I think that is uh, my answer to your question. But what we want uh, is that we want uh, the youth to, be fully, to, to fully understand our development plans because if, if you want to contribute, you need first to understand what is going on in your country. This is why in my remarks this morning, I tried to, to talk about our development plan. Uh, I started first by talking about our national strategy for transformation. Then I mentioned our plan for uh, 2050. And uh, when you know, you know about that plan, you see where you fit, depending on the field, you know, your, your field of, uh, of uh, expertise. And then you decide what you can do for your country. Again, uh, contributing to a country development doesn't mean you are sitting in the country. Geographically speaking, as uh, uh, Dr. Craig said, you can contribute to your development, your, your, your country development wherever you are. Being here in the U.S. or in Rwanda, wherever you are, you can you know, contribute. And uh, also we need to see, uh, to make sure that uh, our youth have the right skills they, 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 they need to have to be able to respond to the market needs. This is why as a government, actually most of you uh, sitting here, we actually including myself, are benefit from uh, the, the government scholarship going to, you know, when we're going to study abroad. That is uh, one. But also even today in Rwanda, we're trying to make sure that our young people can attend some uh, what you call technical and vocational training to make sure that they have skills needed to on on, on labor market. And also, what we want from we expect from you is the active participation in our development agenda, uh, using uh, through, for example, through the technology transfer. I was going to actually to ask one question, but maybe we are we coming back. We are talking now about the way you can contribute to our development agenda. And I can see in this room, we have a lot of people who have a different, uh, who have a knowledge in different fields. And we're thinking, if we start by very, very simple thing, when you come to Rwanda for just a holiday of a week, why don't you call us and try to arrange just a 30 minute conference at one of universities, one of our universities? Then you talk to our colleague, our young people. If you are, for example, electronic engineer, you talk to young people who are now in the second year of university trying to do, uh, I mean, doing their electronic engineer. You inspire them. And from there, you come back to the U.S., you know what's needed in our country. And you inspire also your little brothers and sisters. So that's going to be a good start. And then later on, we'll be growing. This morning, people were talking about the alumni network. You can start by that very simple things. You come from, you are coming from vacation, you spend just one hour, 
we are there to help you uh, because we are on the ground to help you wherever you want to go. If you want to go to one campus in the south or in the eastern province or in the north, we, try, we can try to arrange that kind of meeting. You meet other young or future young professionals in, who are there in Rwanda. Then you talk to them. And if you do that as a group, I think the impact will be more tangible. So we can start by simple things like that. But this, this is going to be my question to our colleagues here to see what we can do. Uh, because if we're having this kind of very good meeting, I think we need also to have some resolution from it and make sure that you're going to try to implement what you have decided from this meeting. I thank you so much. Thank you. Thanking the organizers. This is an excellent initiative. And to thank you for, for being here. I think everything has been said by my colleagues, really. Um, and there's very little I can add which is useful. I'm just going to tell you three things. You know, there are about 50 million uh, Chinese who don't live in China, who are not even holding Chinese nationality. They live in the whole of Southeast Asia, Malaysia, 23 million, the Philippines, uh, all over the small region. So you have got a big China and those small China around it. I want you to go and research and you'll see what happened when China was beginning its journey for transformation. Those uh, Chinese diaspora played a huge role. They didn't have to go to China. But through uh, the kind of things mentioned here, they're the ones who played a big role in the 80s. Actually, I do recall meeting a woman who is uh, from Hong Kong, and she owns uh, one of the biggest laundry firms in Hong Kong. And she told me that in 1980, Three, she was sending people in the southern part of China to teach people how to do double entry bookkeeping. Double entry bookkeeping. It doesn't get as simple as that. But I am convinced, and you can go and research, that without those uh, diaspora Chinese in Southeast Asia, it would have taken China much longer for its transformation. They didn't go back to China, but they contributed from where they were. In fact, the former leader of China at the time, uh, Deng Xiaoping, actually arranged for many of them to travel to, uh, to those areas. And I want to add, at the same time, China, which had a very small number of Chinese students abroad, began a policy deliberately of sending millions of Chinese students all over the world. It was a policy. Some have returned to China, others have not. But they are contributing to the development of their country. Now my last point, uh, before I answer John's provocative question, just uh, now that I'm sitting next to the Prime Minister, think of uh, the diaspora of Rwandans in 1990. The young men of your age who came to liberate the country. It was a different type of diaspora. But think of the role those young people played in the liberation transformation of this country. So that was the first part of our political liberation. Now you have the tax of helping in the transformation in the, uh, in the uh, completing that process. As John was saying, uh, those young people who took up arms or who supported them from abroad, they didn't ask anything from anybody. They just knew it was their task, it has to be carried out, and it was carried out. So that is what you should always uh, remember. Now, finally, uh, I think it was uh, the president of Niger who was championing the CFTA, but whoever. The important thing he mentioned is that you are proudly Rwandan, but you're also proudly African. And on Africa Day like this, think that Rwanda is your base, but Africa is your theater. You know, one time, uh, the former president of Tanzania, who, who passed away, uh, the father of that nation, gave a speech in the South African Parliament, which I want to recommend to all African young people. He was saying, uh, I think he traveled, and was asked, uh, what is going on in, uh, uh, there was a country having trouble, ah, in Sierra Leone. What is going on in Sierra Leone? But he said, I'm not from Sierra Leone. I'm from Tanzania. But they say, you're African. All right? But he said, it never occurs to me that when I meet a European leader, say a German leader, to ask him what is going on in Kosovo. 
what is going on in Bosnia. Because for the external world, they see us fundamentally as Africans. And so as General was saying, we have a mission. I have a mission to say we are Rwandans, proudly Rwandans. Rwanda is our base, but we are proudly African, as my colleagues were saying. And on a day like this, Africa Day, uh, go out and celebrate. It's an important uh, day for us because that continent, for it to have its force in the world, will have to come together. Uh, and this is what the president was working on uh, during the time he was chairman of the AU and on Africa reforms. But thank you. Otherwise, everything was said. The, my only contribution might be to give Clay all my time. Um, my name is Bernice Muchiza, and I have a question about government policies in relation to education in Rwanda. So I believe I'd be asking the uh, Honorable Prime Minister. So earlier, Mr. Hickson with KICS discussed the efforts to educate the educators. And my question is, what could the government do or what is the government already doing to ensure that these these opportunities are available for the educators in public schools in less fortunate parts of the country in order to ensure that the students that graduate from those, from those schools have the same quality education and possibly those scholarships that a student from KICS could be able to get and also get up here like all of us and even further. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think we can take, like, uh, one more question, then we proceed. Uh, my question is directed to Dr. Uh, Kabiruka. So you've been the president for uh, African Development your name? Banks. Say your name again, one more time. Your name? Sorry, my name is Krastedi Irumva. So my question has always been, why do we always seek help from uh, the Westerns? And uh, African is really, uh, I strongly believe, is the richest continent on this planet. So in your opinion, um, for all these past years, did you see um, African developing the mindset of uh, bringing up the resources from itself? That's my question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we can first answer these first two questions, and we can proceed again. So starting with uh, Prime Minister, the question about education. Thank you so much for the questions. Um, let me start by giving one, one very important number. Our population, our annual population growth is 2.7 percent. And uh, it, that gives you an idea about the number of children we have every year going to school. And we, those kids need, uh, uh, that means that we need to have more schools, more classrooms. I checked the numbers of uh, uh, babies we had last year. Within six months, we had, that was uh, th around 300,000 babies we had. When you see that kind of number, it means after six years, those people, we need to go to, prim to start primary school. So we need additional classrooms. But before they go to primary school, they need also to do the pre-primary. I want to start by... Uh, giving that number because we're educating our people and we're educating our, our young people, our, our children. Now, what's happening in Rwanda now is that we have some challenges in, 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 in education. One of them is old classrooms we have. We need to change them to replace them. There's also a growing number of children going to school, so we need additional schools. But also we need to work on the quality of education and when we talk about, about quality of education, it means not only classrooms, but also equipment, school equipment, computers, furniture, books, and so on. And that goes with the, numbers of, uh, with the number of students. Uh, we, have, uh, we are trying our best in education because uh, if you, you follow what we, uh, especially our, our, our decision, our government decision, a few months ago, I think that was two months ago, we... In our cabinet meeting, we had more than 10 decisions about education. One of them was the, the, the career path of our teachers. 
because what was there was that uh, some young people may not want to go to teach because they don't, they don't see their future. Now what you have done, one policy, because she was asking about policies, one policies was to define the career path of our teachers. Now what you have done is to, to, to try to, uh, to strengthen our TTCs, what you call TTCs, teacher training centers, those are the centers which, uh, uh, in which we train our, 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 our future teachers in primary schools, because that's the entry point, the primary school. And we have decided that the person who is going to attend to, to go to that uh, TTC will have a half, we have to pay just a half of the school fees because we want people to go to, that, to those kind of trainings. And when you finish your, 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 your TTC, you will teach like for between two and three years, you will have a free scholarship to do your university if you want to keep doing education. And then after bachelor's degree, you will teach again two years in high school, then we have a scholarship for university. That, for that, we are trying to define the career path of our teachers so that they can be motivated to go to teaching profession. To be, to profession. The second one was, uh, I think, to tell you what, that we, we, we are really trying to focus on education. We said we cannot talk about the quality of education without thinking of our teachers. This is why, since, the beginning, since, the, uh, the, the, since March this year, we try to increase the teacher salary by 10%. And that's a process which is going to, to continue. And those teachers, I'm talking about those are the teachers for primary school and secondary schools. Uh, now, the other thing we try to do is also to make sure that we have the school construction process. Uh, it can't be complete because, as I said, our population is growing. But like, um, now we are having a very big project of $200 million to make sure that at least we build, let me tell you another number, which is our need in terms of school construction. Today, if we ask, you ask me the number of classrooms we need, we need almost 22,000 classrooms, additional classrooms. Now, with that project, we say at least we can build a half of the, that number. We'll be building within three years, we build almost 12,000 new classrooms. So I'm trying to put these numbers on the table to show you how, as a government, we really think about you know, uh, our education and how we can improve the, the quality of education. Uh, also, uh, we have noticed also that um, to, to have uh, hands-on skills, uh, our, our, our young people need to have hands-on skills. This is why we're investing heavily in what you call TVET, teacher, uh, sorry, the, uh, technical vocation, vocational training. Because we, 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 we have seen that uh, our young people need to have hands-on skills in terms of construction uh, and d different, different kind of uh, skills. So now almost 60% of, of our young people who finish the, the, the high school, they got those TV to, have, to make sure that they have hands-on skills so that they can come back on the labor market and have something to do and get uh, you know, uh, income. So uh, I cannot list uh, all, all policies we have in education, but I can really confirm that, uh, assure that we, we are really working uh, uh, day and night on our education, improving quality, make sure that you have uh, furniture, make sure that you have uh, schools, that make sure that you have, uh, uh, I think I've also had about the concept of uh, smart classrooms. We have schools, also we try to improve them, make sure that our kids can use uh, more than uh, technologies like computer have had about one, lap one laptop by child. Now we're talking about uh, smart classrooms where we make sure that at least every school can have at least 100 computers. But of course there are some things to do before. You have to put electricity first before you bring a computer. Those are efforts we are trying to do to make as a country. Uh, I think those are some examples I can give in terms of, uh, in terms of education, but the list is long. Thank you. So <clears throat> the second question was direct to uh, Dr. Kaviruka regarding the why do we need a Western help? Look, I, I can be very brief because the answer for that one is very simple. Uh, it's about mindsets and organization. And uh, I'll just give you two examples and uh, I don't want to be efficient with time. Uh, when I was head of the African Development Bank, we came up with an initiative to do this. You know, if you combine our long-term savings in Africa, long-term savings, which are available, which are usable, 
you know, pension funds, uh, provident funds, and a bit of reserves, not all of it. Uh, I found that actually we could fund most of our development on the continent if we invested money on the continent. Because a lot of those resources are right now invested outside the continent. Of course, they don't get very much. If you buy 30 uh, U.S. Treasury paper, if you're lucky, you probably get, what, 0.7%, I think, 0.7%. And we uh, tried to figure out a plan on how actually we could collectively invest our long-term savings. And the returns were north of 5 6%. But the mindset is, no, I better invest in the U.S. Treasury paper. I better invest abroad because my money is safer that way. Now, that is not true because they lost a lot of money during the global financial crisis. Not inside Africa, outside Africa. But the mindset is what it is. Now, the second is organization, and this is why the president was heavily involved in an attempt to reform the African Union. Now, uh, what were the resistance? Uh, now, since the Minister of Foreign Affairs here, maybe he can answer. There was a lot of resistance, again, because of mindset. But there were some achievements. But one, I think, that we could have done better on financing. Because the African Union, the total budget, if you put together everything except uh, peacekeeping and that kind of stuff, would be about $600 million. $600 million. Now, for the 55 countries in Africa, we can afford that. And we show them how we can pay for that. However, it is a work in progress. A uh, work in progress uh, because uh, some countries, again, have a mindset of the foreigners will fund our organization. And therefore, I do believe that this work of reforming the Union, which the President began and accomplished some distance, has to continue so that we are better organized in terms of natural resource management, both long and short term, in terms of human development, in terms of ensuring that this famous uh, peace dividend is realized. And that is you, people, who have to do it, wherever you are. Because without a strong African Union, Without an organized continent, we shall continue to be weak and uh, balkanized, and that is the main source of the weakness. But I do believe uh, a lot of work has been done. I think there's a lot of le young leaders coming up, uh, hope future people like you, you can go a step further. That, that is the only way it can happen. Look, India today is only a member of the G20, which is growing above 7%. But India is one country, over 1 billion people, one country, all right? One currency, all right? Does not have 55 currencies. Now, things like that will have to come, and maybe you people will succeed to do it. Thank you. Nitwari Sekiusa, Ba Murwanda Rwa, Indiana, Haturi Yarkov, more specifically from South Bend, Indiana. I have a, a question, maybe a suggestion also for a change of policy in Muri Health, Nyakwa Prime Minister. Uh, a couple months ago, I was um, lucky to, I'll call it lucky, to visit, um, to tour actually uh, a few hospitals in Rwanda because um, I'm very much interested in contributing uh, in treating cancer. I'm a cancer survivor. And um, while we were visiting, Thank you, um, Dr. Kreti. I was at the uh, Kandi Ugaroko Shime. That's what I'm trying to accomplish. Um, so, Mijena Suraga, Atwa Suraga is a hospital with uh, hospitals with my, my uh, oncologist who saved me from leukemia. We came to realize that um, our Mituel, Dosante, does not cover cancer treatment in Rwanda. They told us, unless I am not, I mistakenly understood, that uh, uh, Mituel covers cancer diagnosis, but does not cover cancer treatment. My understanding is that maybe cancer treatment is because it's very uh, expensive, and chemo drugs can be very, very costly. So I was wondering if there is a possibility, maybe it's being done already to make that policy change, so at least uh, people who have Mituel do can uh, have that possibility of being treated and cured from cancer. Uh, my other request is to Dr. Kletti. 
as a researcher and uh, heavily involved in cancer research, also as the founder of um, Lee Pharmaceutical. The other challenge we are running into um, by trying to contribute back home is that uh, cancer drugs can be, are very, very expensive. And I was wondering if on the continent, maybe in East Africa or in Rwanda, there are any pharmaceutical companies that are developing uh, cheap uh, chemo drugs that Abanwa um, Fitenga Mitwer can afford to buy. Changwa if there is a way Leaf Pharmaceutical Company can chip in. Why are we waiting for the drug discovery to be, to succeed, to kuranjira nguza ajire kubijo yifu za kujira ho? What can we, done in mean, can we do in the meantime to make sure that uh, the channel supply of chemo drugs are available to simple Rwandans? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, the answer is yes. We are, we are, we are revising the, the, the Mitre de Sante policy now. We are working on it since uh, the beginning of this year because we have noticed that there, there, are some, there were some issues. And uh, maybe I can give you some numbers. Again, I like to talk with numbers because the numbers, you know, they, you, you, you have uh, a picture. You know, when Mitre de Sante was introduced, very few people used to go to hospital to look for medical treatment because the treatment was expensive when you compare to their income. We have seen people who are going to look for those uh, medical treatment, and the number, I, I, I can give you just one number. Like in uh, 2017, we had 70 million people who went to look for some services from uh, health facilities. And I don't want to talk about those people because some of them will go to hospitals, other to, to health centers, other, other to health posts, because those are different categories. But 2018, that number doubled. The number was almost, but this is the number of consultation, not the number of people. The, the, the number of times people went to see a medical doctor or a nurse, that number doubled. It was 15 million times. Which shows you that are, that goes with the amount of money to pay. So, Mitre de Santé, we, we found that if we don't restructure Mitre de Santé, we'll be having issues. We want our people to have medical care, but also that goes with money. This way, we're trying to restructure Mitre de Santé and, may, and know the, which kind of treatment people have Mitre de Santé can have. And uh, so, we are trying to, 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 to increase the list of medical treatment those people can have. So, we're restructuring it, and I think within a few months, we have uh, the policy uh, approved. So that is uh, something we're working on, and uh, we, we are sure that we have a good result in a few, in a few years. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Clay? So, Alice, uh, f first of all, um, thank you for sharing. Uh, I think uh, one of the things that that we don't hear a lot in, in Africa is, is the story of a survivor. And there is a reason why they don't survive. It's because of precisely there is no drug to, to, to sustain uh, that survival. I'll, I'll give you one particular example that actually made me angry, but in a good way, so that I, I wanted to make a difference. So I was at, um, at the cancer center in Utah. And I was talking to uh, Dr. Paul Farmer. And he happened to, to walk me through the hospital where there were two ladies with breast cancer uh, who were supposed to be on a drug called gemcitabine. And gemcitabine is a, is a drug approved here in the United States for the last 22 years for the treatment of, uh, of breast cancer and lung cancer. And he was actually telling me how this is an important drug, but they don't get it, at least on a regular basis. Uh, and that there was a lady who was taking it, but they ran out of it. And once they do that, of course, there is a, there is a, a, a progressive uh, 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 track of, of the disease. What he did know in that conversation is that in 1992, I was one of the inventors of gemcitabine here at Eli Lilly and Company. 
in Indianapolis, literally two miles from here. That's where we discovered this drug. Initially targeting HIV, but it turns out to be very toxic and we ended up uh, developing it for, for breast and lung cancer. Uh, got it approved uh, in US and Europe in uh, the first time in 1995 uh, for, for pancreatic cancer and 97 for lung and 98 for breast. So there I was in, in my homeland with two ladies who probably will progress to die because they don't have access to a drug I happen to have discovered, not just for Africa, but for the world. That made me very upset. And to some extent, it, it really pushed me to another leg of the discussion that I didn't catch up. Uh, we were very fortunate to have from the, the cabinet uh, a free land in the Rwanda, in, in uh, Masoro, uh, that is managed by RDB, where we're planning to put a 20, maybe $25 million drug manufacturing plant. And, and, and the reason I thought we should go that way is really two. One is to protect patients because you can have a generic gemcitabine, this drug, made out of India, but some of the Indian companies don't show up to get them approved in the United States because they are not always doing it under the same standards as the, as the original drug, which is here. So I figured that if, if we put a plant there and we start actually looking into making generic drugs, that's not really the original plan. The plan is to make uh, um, innovative drugs and then move to the same pace as the West. But, no, but also there are critical drugs that are not available on the continent that we want to make sure we make, but we make them under the same standards as what, what it was originally, which will be, for example, how we, we, manufacture, we discovered and manufactured it here uh, at Delay Lydia and Company. But that's one particular example. Another one is a drug called uh, Doxyl, which is a nanoparticle that, that, that contains doxorubicin. It's a, it's a drug that is also very famous for treating uh, breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and Kaposi sarcoma, which is a cancer that develops when uh, an HIV-infected patient resists to retroviral. You see that case now prevalent in East Africa, so Uganda, Kenya, and then Southern Africa. You don't see many cases in Rwanda. And even when you do, they're probably usually coming from those countries because there is a national program for, 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 for making sure that people are taking the drug. That disease has been wiped out here. It was a problem here. It was wiped out because of this drug called Doxyl. Turns out that making it requires some technology, and no one bothered to actually make it f and make it accessible in Africa. Um, uh, in the United States, it's approved for ovarian cancer in Europe for breast and lung and, 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 uh, and ovarian and Kaposi sarcoma, but in Africa, y you have to basically search hard. You can find it in some white clinics in South Africa, but it's ex extremely expensive. So one of the things we decided, since we have that technology at Leaf Pharmaceuticals, is to start manufacturing it in the United States before we put our plants in Kigali and make sure it goes to Kigali. And that should start uh, in, an, in, in the first quarter of next year. Right now we're manufacturing it. It will probably be the only source on the continent that gives that drug. It has commercial implications, so we want to make sure that it is available to the rest of the continent from Rwanda. And in fact, I have a team right now in Kigali that is preparing for eventually launching that, that drug out of the Rwanda Military Hospital and then, and then Butaro. Um, so it's a fight that has to continue. Um, and uh, we're taking a shot at it. And I think we have a good one. Thank you. I wanted to ask, uh, what is the government
doing to promote computer science education, especially at an early stage? Uh, like, not just in colleges, but can students start learning computer science in all level uh, when they are still 13? We understand that may take, like, we don't have teachers with that type of capacity, but can the government create, like, a, a self-teaching curriculum that interested and motivated students can follow? Uh, that's my question. Thank you. I think uh, when I was um, giving, uh, giving you the list of uh, members of our delegation, I mentioned our permanent secretary and the minister of ICT. Maybe she can... I, I want to give her the floor yeah. so that she can uh, answer that question. Uh, the question on uh, computer science at an early stage. What plans do, does the country have to teach computer science at an early stage? This is also one of, one of the things that have been really um, uh, bugging us. And uh, recently, I think it was in um, January, we launched the first uh, Rwanda Coding Academy in Rwanda. Uh, where we, well, it's not that early stage, but uh, for students that are starting the advanced level, we've we've been really selective. Uh, we've 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 picked uh, creme de la creme. Uh, that means the brightest students, um, and uh, they are now studying. Um, three majors, I think one is embedded systems, and then there's AI, and then there's um, um, something around robotics and software development. Um, and there are in Nyabihu, it's a school that was specifically set up to teach students to really become the best in this. Now, um, borrowing what the Right Honorable Prime Minister said, if you are coming to Rwanda, you have an opportunity to, to actually come and maybe teach a class or talk to these students and see um, how you can really steer uh, their careers towards becoming uh, professionals. Uh, I hope that answers. Thank you. Thank you so much. Maybe, uh, maybe to add to what the PSA said is, um, uh, that coding academy is one of uh, the best schools we are having now in, in Rwanda. But also we have, uh, when I was talking about smart classrooms, that is at primary school level, where our kids start, you know, using a uh, computer from the primary school. And when I was saying that uh, schools have to have a hundred computers, at least those are the primary schools. And uh, he asked me another question things we need to change as a young professional. Uh, my, I, I think I, I will advise, my advice to you, or to everyone, I know you love your country, you love our country, keep loving our country, of course, uh, and uh, be innovative, because our country wants innovation, and the innovation will come from you. Recently, we contacted a study that was joint study between the government of Rwanda and World Bank Group. One of the, the studies called the, the, the future drivers of our economic growth. And uh, one of the findings was that uh, our future economic growth will come from innovation. And when you talk about innovation, I see all of you, you can innovate in your different fields. Uh, so be innovative. The second one as advice is be result oriented. That one I was when I'm talking to young people I say please let's try to be result oriented. Whatever you do, be result oriented.